Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Board of Selectmen. Selectmen. Uh, it's September 24th, 2018. Chris Collins is behind the desk and he's very punctual. Um, so the time is 637. Um, we have a few things coming up. We have a 630 appointment with Rachel, Rachel Stroller, Stroller from the FERCOG Board of Health. We're going to talk about communities that care and youth substance use prevention. So uh, since it's 630, Rachel, why don't you start? Okay, thank you. So um, I know I have a short amount of time, so I will try to go quickly and leave some time for discussion. But basically tonight, the things that I'd like to cover are what is the Communities That Care Coalition, even though we have a few people who know very well what it is. Um, what can towns do to reduce substance use disorder? And I'm using that term intentionally. That's the, the um, appropriate term that, that we use in substance use prevention right now. Um, and what interests your board in particular. And I have a handout that I'll give out towards the end of the presentation that's kind of a menu of different um, policy options. So um, a few things about the Communities That Care Coalition, in case you're not familiar with it. It is a health-focused coalition. We focus on youth outcomes, particularly reducing substance use among youth, but we also um, have goals of reducing other youth problem behaviors and increasing nutrition and physical activity. Um, the coalition involves a wide range of sectors, as you can see from the screen, um, and we are driven by data, and our primary source of data is the Teen Health Survey, which we have been collaborating with all the public, middle, and high school districts on since 2003. So every year there is a trove of data, health data, from young people. Um, and we use a collective impact approach, which involves bringing together a number of sectors, um, a variety of sectors, focusing on common goals, shared measurements, so that we all kind of can celebrate the same successes, mutually reinforcing activities, um, continuous communication and having backbone support. So um, our team, Partnership for Youth from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, provides the backbone for the Communities That Care Coalition, but we are not the sole group in charge of it. Um, our chair, our coalition is chaired by someone from Community Action Youth Programs, and then we have a coordinating council that represents a wide variety of um, local groups. So. Um, we, uh, we do our work through work groups, um, we, and the work groups represent a response to different risk and protective factors, which I'll talk about in a minute. But we have the parent education work group, um, which focuses on parent education and building um, family management skills. We have the Regional School Health Task Force, which has representatives from all of the school districts and started out as the group that planned the survey. But at this point, the survey is such an easy lift, the school districts are all very used to it, and so the Regional School Health Task Force focuses on bringing um, evidence-based programming to the school districts and figuring out how that needs to be supported. We have the Youth Leadership Initiative. Um, when our coalition first started, we were more focused on sort of youth activities and recognizing young people, and now that's evolved into seeing how young people can be involved in decision making both within the coalition but also on boards um, in, within nonprofits and on committees within towns. So I don't know if there are any town committees that um, would like to have young people involved, but um, if so, you should speak to me and I can put you in touch with the right people. We also have the Policy and Practice Change Work Group which um, addresses um, community laws and norms that may either favor or discourage substance use, and then the Mass and Motion Steering Committee, on which Sherry is a member, um, a long-standing member, which focuses on the uh, healthy eating and active living outcomes. Um, we also have a new work group that we are starting this year, if anyone is interested. We have a racial justice work group that we are starting <coughs> up, and we are looking for new members. Um, Every year we do a community action plan in which each work group identifies its priorities. And I actually brought a couple of copies um, if you want to pass those around and I can leave them here. Um, but it does illustrate what each work group prioritizes. Um, and each work group has a page that has what looks sort of like a bullseye on it. 
um, and the interior of the bullseye are kind of the core activities that each work group kind of leads or oversees, but then the outer ring are all the other things that are happening in the community um, about which the, the Communities That Care Coalition is aware and tries to lift up and collaborate with those community agencies, even though we, we're not in a position to take credit for those activities, we want to make sure that they're supported. Um, and we always make sure to select strategies that work well with other efforts in the community and that make sense in the community. There's no point in doing something that no one's going to support. Um, so we are, you know, are always looking for what's going to work. Um, as I mentioned, we're data driven um, and most of that data comes from the teen health survey. That's the local data, but then we also get um, state level data. We get national data as well. Um, so anything, we're kind of data nerds. Um, and we're also very big on presenting that data in the community. So um, I'm gonna make a shameless plug for, if you've never been to a Communities That Care Coalition full coalition meeting and would like to come, we are having one this Friday from 12 to two at the um, Transit Center where the FERCOG has its offices upstairs and we're gonna have our meeting downstairs. Um, and if you are interested, just talk to me after the meeting. I'll make sure you get an um, invitation and registration information. Um, but I mentioned risk factors, and that's, um, that's kind of the reason why I'm here tonight, risk and protective factors. So risk factors are things either within the community, within the family, within an individual's experience, or within the school environment that would make it more likely that someone would engage in a risky behavior like substance use. And then protective factors are the opposite. Those are the things that make it less likely, that, that reduce the likelihood. Um, and so some of the risk factors, um, there are variable, variable risk factors, including income level and peer group. And, and you know some risk factors are harder to address than others. Um, but tonight, I really wanted to talk about um, community level risk factors. So some of those include neighborhood poverty and violence. Um, but protective factors could include the availability of faith-based resources or after-school activities, just to cite a few examples. Um, and so norms and laws within a community that favor substance use, that encourage it or make it look like it's not that much of a problem, um, but also racism within a community or lack of economic opportunity also contribute to increasing the likelihood of problem behaviors. Um, and protective factors on a community or policy level might include um, hate crime laws or policies limiting the availability of alcohol or other policies which we'll get into in a few minutes. But I guess the sort of message of this presentation is that um, municipal government really has a big role in helping to create the policies and the norms that, you know, that either favor substance use or make it less likely. So you actually have a great role to play um, as a town. So I just wanted to show you this. We're, as I told you, we're data nerds. We love showing graphs. Um, so if you're into that stuff, come and hang out with us. Sherry's well aware of our interest in graphs. Um, so that uh, the yellow line in particular, those are laws and norms that favor drug use as a risk factor. And you can see we're tracking from 2003 to 2015 in this particular graph, and you can see how um, laws and norms that favor drug use, and this is over the whole region right now, um, they have come down, although there's a slight uptick between 2012 and 2015. Um, there is individual data for each district, so the Frontier District has been participating in the survey since it started in 2003, um, and if you're interested in the individual data from the district, we we do not distribute it out of respect for the school districts, but the school districts have it, and Sarah Mitchell at um, the Frontier District is happy to share that if you are interested. Um, and they may decide to do presentations about the data. Um, so this is just a way to say municipal, municipal policies can be protective factors. Um, and this is just another graph that shows of the um, substance use issues that we've been tracking, um, the top line, that blue line, is alcohol use, and that refers to 30-day alcohol use, so regular use. Um, the red line is binge drinking, so that's um, having four or more drinks in one sort of sitting. Marijuana use is the green line, and that, as you can see, is not, has not dropped as precipitously 
um, as the other lines have, and part of that, as you can imagine, may be due to um, the legalization of medical marijuana, the legalization of recreational marijuana, and the perception that marijuana isn't so harmful. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to work with is to educate people about the effect on the developing brain. You know, adults can make their decisions about substance use and, and we don't have any problem with that, but we wanna make sure that they understand that youth substance use can really have a big impact on the developing brain. Um, and then that bottom one is cigarette use, which has dropped precipitously. As you might guess, what is going up well, is- I was just getting your phone in that, to answer my question, that like, they e-cigarette use and all that. Yes. Um, and so that's something that we are trying to figure out how to address. And unfortunately, the companies that produce those materials and market those materials have some absolutely brilliant people working with them. Um, and they've gotten, you know, they've gotten very far ahead for, of the prevention community, but we're, we're right behind them. Um, so, and I had mentioned this before, but we focus on youth outcomes, not adult outcomes. Um, we support and collaborate with groups that work on opioids and tobacco, um, and those are substances that need prevention efforts for all age groups. We work closely with the Opioid Task Force, with the Community Health Improvement Plan. Um, so we definitely collaborate with all the groups that focus on the broad population, but our particular coalition is focused on youth outcomes. So municipal policies, what we're here to talk about, are an important piece of the puzzle. And I brought with me some handouts. We can pass those out now. Um, this is a menu of, um, and if you want more than one copy, there are plenty of them. So, and I also sent this to Sherry, um, and we're always updating it. So um, Sherry has the electronic copies of both this and my presentation. Um, so the, this is just a menu of options. It's not like every town is gonna implement every one of these, but it's just ideas. And again, um, when you think about implementing policies, you have to think about what might work in your town. There might be something on this list that you look at and you say, oh, that'll never fly in Sunderland, but something else might. So it's really important to think about what could work. Um, so, um, so these are just examples from different, um, for different substances, uh, and they're, they're detailed in the handout. Um, so for example, um, for marijuana, uh, there are a lot of policies that are still being looked at and experimented with. The Mass Association of Health Boards um, is starting to develop some templates, so those are kind of in the works. Um, the Boston Public Health Association, I did want to mention, um, has developed a great marijuana policy for the city of Boston, so that may be worth looking at. Um, and uh, so there, there are various resources that are available. So some examples of municipal alcohol policies, um, I know that Sunderland establishments have participated in server trainings, because um, I used to organize them, and um, so I know that that's, um, that's something that happens. Um, and I, you know, I don't know which of these other policies you might have already implemented. Um, I don't know if you have keg registration. Um, yeah, we actually do. You do. Yep. Um, or if uh, um, if the police investigate um, houses where there are parties. Um, I don't know how much your social host the, the social host law is a um, state law, but I don't know how much it's um, you know enforced here. So those are some things to think about on the alcohol front. Um, and then tobacco, um, I was really happy to see that um, almost all of these policies you've already passed in Sunderland. Um, uh, I don't know about smoke-free multi-unit housing. Um, so I don't know if that's a law, but everything else, ban on tobacco sales in pharmacies, cap on the number of retail licenses, flavored tobacco ban, restriction on cheap cigars and Lucy's, and the Tobacco 21 you've already passed. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, so you, you've already done a lot for tobacco and you'll be hearing more from us about um, vaping when we kind of get on top of that. Does anybody know about um, multi-unit housing? Like, Can't answer that question right yeah. now. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Because um, I know you have a lot of multi-unit housing. Um, so as I mentioned, marijuana policy is that. Uh, the state is still catching up with that. 
Um, but the Mass Association of Health Boards is a really great resource um, to check in with, um, and they're developing templates for things like host community agreements, zoning bylaws. Did you look at um, passing a tax on um, recreational marijuana? We're doing that now. It's in front of the as we speak. For okay. Space and yep. Yep. discussion for a So I know that other towns um, in Franklin County have passed it. Montague passed it. You have language for um, host community agreements for that's what's being oh. developed. Um, so check out the Mass Association of Health Boards, and we're also like, you know, as soon as we get some templates for it, we will pass it on to it's, the towns. It's not finished yet. I mean, it, there is a draft host agreement from the state, um, but also host agreements can also be tailored. Right. right? So it's not, you know, like it's just suggestions. Mm -hmm. There are some requirements. Um, like uh, no more than we, we can't do more than three percent of gross sales as a as a I'm going to use the word tax um, <laughs> as a payment for um, the expenditures of having that type of business in town, and um, there's some limits on what the town can spend that money on. Amherst wrote a very, very well-written letter um, asking for clarification on three specific issues, uh, three specific items. Um, I happen to print it out. Oh, this is great. Thank you. And um, the three items they asked for clarification on, and it's to help everybody, um, are... Um, The flexibility to enter into agreements um, that reflect communities' unique characteristics and values, uh, because uh, as far as what to do with um, with, ed with the money, with the education, uh, a lot of um, with the the draft agreement, uh, you can put the money towards education for the first year. But what Amherst is saying is. Because we get an influx of students pretty much every year, we need to educate yeah. almost forever. Mm -hmm. So can we use that money to do that? Mm -hmm. um, so please clarify. And they were asking for clarification from the Cannabis Control Commission? Yes. Okay. The Cannabis Control Commission. And then um, second, um, uh, guidance to confirm that municipalities are able to recover as part of the community impact fee costs that are reasonably related to the existence of marijuana establishments that but can't be attributed to a specific establishment. So like uh, drug recognition expert training. So I'm not even sure if we have a DRE on Central and Police Force. Um, that is a specifically trained officer. What we do now is call. Um, so say they pull somebody over and mm -hmm. they don't smell of alcohol, but boy, they look impaired. Yep. They'll call for a DRE. Mm -hmm. It's usually state police, but the DREs now, especially, they'll be like, yeah, I can be there in an hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> so, so you have um, to detain the person that long? Well, or you can, if they're cross sworn, you can call, say, hey, Greenfield is you know, Sergeant whatever on is who is a DRE. And that's a, a trained drug rescue mission expert that runs through uh, field sobriety tests. I know Deerfield has at least one. We may have one, I just honestly can't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. I, um, and with, you know, opioids and with marijuana, you know, you're not gonna have the odor. <laughs> but you will have impaired driving. So, and so, um, and municipal employee time, um, and what they're saying is, it's, they're saying their municipal employees have been spending a significant amount of time um, regarding permitting, um, uh, research, learning about <coughs> marijuana laws, the, the zoning, and be permitting throughout. So they're saying, how can we attribute these costs when the host agreement says it needs to be per establishment? Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're asking for clarification, and um, and I think there's going to be a lot of 
uh, clarification asking. Um, because they're kind of saying, um, the guidance says that fees in excess of 3% of gross sales may be permissible. Then the guidance says municipalities may not enter into agreements where the total payment exceeds 3% of gross sales. And they're saying, you just said one paragraph this, and then a non-paragraph this. Um, so I was, I was thought that this was an excellent, excellent letter. Um, I, um, it, it's on their website. Uh, but what I then did was I, um, I printed off their um, Board of Health. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I printed off Northampton's Board of Health um, requirements with regard to marijuana, and they are fantastic. Um, so what we're going to do is put it on our agenda for the next meeting uh, because they have some really, truly wonderful um, ideas that I think we should be thinking of. And I don't need to hijack your meeting. No, not at all. This is, I think this is really helpful. Thank you. Something that's extremely important, that's extremely dangerous, that they thought of, and it was like that aha moment for me, was the one thing about edibles Mm -hmm. that is probably one of the most dangerous things is portion size. Yeah. The edible portion size is like a cookie is about, it's usually around four servings. Mm -hmm. So who, who is going to eat a quarter of a cookie? Right. Especially the same thing with candy bars, like right. one serving is one tiny square. Right. Who really or the gummy eats bears. One square? Right. It's probably unrealistic. Three gummy bears. Yeah. 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 So they're requiring one serving. Smart. Now, everything packaged needs to be one serving. That's fabulous. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, that also causes a little bit of a ruckus because if it comes in prepackaged from Colorado, everything's right. got to be ripped open, <laughs> cut <laughs> up, and repackaged, or what, however you're going to do it. But I think that's wonderful because if you're going to eat four of them, eat four of them, but know what you're eating. Yeah. Well, I, I, one of the concerns I've always had is. is the, the, like edibles getting into like kids' hands oh, or something yes. like that because you know adults you have to you know assume that they're at least they can read but you, yeah you know what I mean and that that's always been a little a little bit of a concern there where unlike alcohol I mean you you don't have you know a bottle of tequila in a in a form that you're going to worry about a kid consuming it like a gummy bear right so oh, that, don't that's always top. I mean these are like packaged right. for yeah, kids exactly brownies <coughs> cookies. And one of the things, though, the, the really dangerous thing, though, is the serving size. Right. Or accidental consumption. What if they get mixed up with know, the regular olds, gummy bears? Even 25-year-olds, um, you're going to eat a cookie. You're just going to do it. Right. The other or problem is, is the 20-minute <laughs> digestion time. Right. Yep. So you eat a cookie, and you're like, well, I don't feel anything. So you eat another two. one. <laughs> right, right, yep. So, and what's important about the marijuana is when you bake things, you make it with the oil. And what you would know, and what we're learning, is the oil is, can be up to 90% THC content. Mm -hmm. And when back, even probably the 80s, mm -hmm. the smoking with the, the joints mm -hmm. was 7% mm -hmm. marijuana. So there's a little bit of a difference THC. there. So we're talking 90 yeah. That's why we're getting hallucinations. So I go school to school, and I talk to the administrators, and I talk to with my other job. And so what they're going to do is they're also doing some drug recognition training because they're going to be getting some uh, seizures yeah. and hallucinations, and those are some side effects from the edibles, which will be coming in very quickly, very soon. Um, in Springfield, and you know if they're going to be selling in Springfield, right? They're going to be. It's not very far, <laughs> so someone's going to go down there and pick up a whole bunch of stuff, and you know, bring it up to Franklin County, my schools anyway that I go to. I'm just guaranteed. Right. So um, that's. I'd love to talk to you more about the school thing and so, what to do with the regional school health task force. Yes. So right. that was just. So that's kind of what we're doing. Going to do on the board of health is going to look through some um, ways to. Bring this in health-wise um, by small things, and we're not looking. And I think we've always said this: whenever we'd have somebody come in looking for like a, a a permit or whatever, we want to we want 
businesses to thrive. We want people to be happy. If they want marijuana, they voted it in, that's fine. We want to make it safe. Right, just safe and responsible. Florida Health is for the health and safety of Sunderland. So if we can make it safer, then that's our board's job. Not to keep it from being here. Mm -hmm. It was voted in. Right. And we are elected position <laughs> officials. We were voted in too. But if we can make it safer. So if putting limits, safe zones, working with the zoning board about where anything can be, working with the police about safety, that's what we're going to be doing. That's so fantastic. That's that's really wonderful. Thank you for bringing all that. But, but again, I'm sorry. Oh no no! <laughs> I, I was more than happy. Thank you. I'm very and I do want to talk with you about the presentations you give to schools. Well, it's only with the uh, t not the kids or anything. Just we, I just talk with the administrators. No, that's fine. But uh, I want to find out more about that. <laughs> We're networking. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, opioids, as you're well aware, there's. Um, a lot of talk about opioids, and um, we do collaborate closely with the Opioid Task Force. But some of the policies that towns can implement um, are police carrying naloxone, which is the um, medication that can reverse an overdose long enough to get someone to a hospital and get them treated. Um, safe storage of prescription medicine campaigns, like encouraging people to keep their um, prescriptions locked up in a lockbox and to get rid of stuff that they don't use anymore because people tend to you know, get stuff and then it sits around and that, that makes it more vulnerable. Um, and drug take back boxes. I don't know if your police department we has did. one. Yep, we did. Okay. And take back day is October 27th. Yep. But the drug take back box is there all the all time at the police yeah. department. That's wonderful. Um, so, and then other, um, other municipal actions are things about supporting people in recovery because that also helps support young people even if they haven't started using substances. Um, so reducing um, stigma is an important thing to sort of have on the radar screen to talk about, um, to share resources about treatment and recovery at town meetings, town halls, board of health, like make sure that people know where to find these resources. Um, and enforcing public spaces as smoke-free for both marijuana and tobacco. Um, and I know you have some new public spaces, um, and there are some good resources about how to make those kinds of policies. Um, review of alcohol and, and smoking at public events. I know that can be um, an issue, um, you know, who gets to buy, but also where it can be consumed. Um, if there is smoking allowed, uh, are you going to have smoking areas, or is the whole event going to be non-smoking? Um, and um, the anti-stigma pledge, which is mentioned in the handout, um, but the possibility of town leaders signing an anti-stigma <coughs> pledge to kind of reinforce that, um, you know, substance use disorder is an illness, um, it's not a moral failing, and we need to support our folks in recovery in order for them to succeed. Um, so I have time for, do I have time for questions? I don't know how tight your agenda is. No, I actually have a question for you. Okay. Um, how, how aggressive are, is the, the coalition dealing with maybe the root causes of a lot of the problems, like um, sexual abuse, like bullying, mm -hmm. um, which which can really start a lot of this, a lot of these problems. I, I mean, are we trying to are we trying to address those yes. issues as well? And I'm I'm very happy that you asked that question because that is actually the main part of our work is to look at primary prevention and to promote that. So when I mentioned that the regional school health task force looks at what are the evidence-based programs to implement in schools? One of the ones that we've been promoting um, is called the Life Skills Program, which is, um, there are actually levels for elementary, middle, and high school, but the um, most sort of effective one is the one for middle school students, um, and it is being implemented, I'm, it is being implemented in the Frontier District. Um, I can't remember which grades, but it focuses on social emotional skills and building those skills which are a primary prevention strategy that has impacts on preventing substance use, not just in the teen years, but it has impacts for years later, for decades later, um, as well as on violence um, and on um, 
you know, uh, problem relationships. So that's a really important one. There are other um, evidence-based um, strategies that we're also promoting, like um, there are two different suicide prevention curricula that, again, focus on the antecedent stuff, on the, um, on the underlying causes, and, you know, focus on building a community in which, um, you know, students who are experiencing depression know exactly who to go to, people know how to recognize it in students and, and respond to it. Um, and then there's also, in terms of school discipline, promoting um, uh, uh, restorative practices, um, which is similar to restorative justice, except it starts off with 80% is about community building and 20% is about repairing harm. So really focusing on building that community in which there's trust and if something happens, you keep the person in the community and you address the issue rather than starting to address the issue when the something happens. And, and, and again, from my from from what I've read um, and, and been involved with is is that if and you may not think of bullying, you know, as, and again, when we were growing up, it, it was well, it, you know, to, you know, let them alone; they'll figure it out; they'll be friends tomorrow. That that kind of thing, you know, and it could happen to boys or girls. But it seems from all the studies that that when you go back and look at the problem, breaking that cycle of bullying and, and abuse, mm -hmm. and abuse can run in many different things, but you have to, somehow you have to break that. And I, right. I was just wondering, I, I would think, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for opiate addictions and stuff, but a lot of it goes back to these, you know, about, you know, the way people, children, uh, men, women feel about themselves, and it can be directly go back to those um, initial bullying or abuse Absolutely. problems and they and they hold they hold that that stuff internal for a Absolutely. long time yep. and and I, I would just like to see something a little bit more and and for me that that we become more aware of that mm -hmm. um, and 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 you know like one of the things is I think is like organizations faith-based or athletic based or whatever that they may have lax um, policies right and, and so maybe maybe we, we have to reach out either from the towns or the cog or whatever, have to reach out to these organizations mm -hmm. and say, hey, by the way, have you, you know, how do you, you know, do you have policies? In? Yeah. Because that, that's what they prey on. That's right. that what these people prey upon. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, both from a policy level, but also from an educational level. Like um, in the schools, so much of it is about educating staff about, um, the, the way that childhood trauma affects people all through the lifespan and not only in behavior, but behavioral health but in physical health as well. Um, so there's a lot of training, but that doesn't necessarily get applied to nonprofit organizations or even municipal groups like police departments who are also dealing with trauma. Um, and, uh, and understanding, trauma is a big thing because almost everyone has experienced some level of trauma in their life, but if they don't understand how it's impacted them, then it comes out in, you know, Definitely. years later. Um, and so being able to provide trauma-informed training to not only school staff who are seeing young people every day, but to police departments to understand how their own trauma could be affecting their jobs, or to municipal staff, or to... Um, you know, nonprofit staff. So that is definitely our partners are working on that, um, and you know, we can keep you informed as more broad trainings come up. And I would, and I think it's something that we have we have to put we have to get out there. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, I think one, once, and again, we we try to solve the opiate problem, but what what I know that um, it's we. If you th if you think that it's easy to get help if you have a problem, it's not. It's not. It's better to it's, prevent it's not. it. <laughs> and, and, and that and 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 just like you have an al if you have an alcohol problem and you think that you're going to come to that realization, you wake up and say, "I need to stop this," or you have an intervention, you think there's going to be help. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it's very difficult. It is. Um, and programs are not universal. Um, and, and some just like with mental health, sometimes uh, if you. It's not when you need help. You you don't need to go to you you need that, that personal attention, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's very difficult. So right. how do you stop it before you get to that 
you get to that point. Right. Well, that is our focus: is that that primary upstream prevention. Because that's, that's, that's that I think it's, it's that's where you have to address it before it starts. Yep. Once somebody once somebody starts the opiates or or whatever, that that harmful behavior becomes so much more difficult yep. to to stop. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Well, feel free to contact me, and certainly Sherry knows how to get a hold of me. Um, Thank you, Rachel. And um, you know, if you have questions or, or other things that you're interested in and don't know where to look, I would certainly be happy to help you find them. Great. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks. you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Board Health, for coming tonight. Also. <laughs> Yeah, I just have to shut my stuff down. Sure, do you need to stay for anything? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You can have. Yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. I want to check in with Caitlin. We have to uh, get our next meeting. Safe. Sounds like never seems to end, does it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can be yeah. outside. <clears throat> okay. Okay, next up we have. Uh, We have minutes from uh, 910. Uh, motion on those. We have a motion on the acceptance of the minutes and second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, we have uh, approved minutes from 910. Next up is uh, Board of Selectmen updates. David? Um, no updates this week. You all set? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Scotty? Unusual, but <clears throat> excuse me if I could, Mr. Chair. As was reflected in the last uh, minutes we just approved, there was a meeting after our last select board meeting uh, with members of the 120 North Main Working Group, RDI, um, <clears throat> Kersher Design, and uh, the DEP at the DEP office in Springfield. It was about a three hour meeting. It was very, very constructive. Mm. Um, Remember, they are they are um, a body that um, adjudicates standards. So this was not do this, don't do that. This was not a design meeting. They can't do that. There is a friendly peer uh, component that commercial design may take uh, peer review component may take advantage of an RDI in the future. But it was very helpful, I think, for the reps from the 120 North Working Group to uh, participate. I was there, Lauren Starr was there as well. Um, and again, that was very, very helpful. <clears throat> now these, um, reason for meeting with the DEP of course is, is because they are the, the arbiter of the standard. Mm -hmm. So if there's an appeal, it ends up there. So that was helpful. Uh, also, Frontier Capital meeting, working groups meeting is tomorrow, hopefully for the last of our language. Uh, before this goes to the full uh, Frontier School Committee, uh, including some of the borrowing language that Joe Marcani has been working on. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> coincidentally, tomorrow is a, a, a now postponed Sunderland Capital Planning uh, meeting. Our building review, uh, which has been funded through uh, the grant rounds, we think there's a lot of review, but not a lot of plan. Hmm. And so okay. as we push that back toward the architect, um, and I guess maybe the best way to put it is we feel that there's still some elements that are that are need attention, and a couple of elements that may well be needed. That said, it's almost 300 pages of review of the buildings, hmm. current status, current condition. Yep. It's very thorough, but the planning piece we think is a little thin. Did I capture that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, that meeting for tomorrow, we try to coincide that with the planning board meeting because of overlap uh, happens to now be postponed. Uh, new date's coming up. October 23rd. There you go, <laughs> 1023. I think you and I spoke about that today. You yeah, right. have to forgive me for working through that. Um, <clears throat> that's all, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, if, again, we we'll go back to the meetings of 910. One of the things that we, that we discussed at that time, we. We met with uh, John Zachary and uh, Barry Tozlowski concerning some a sewer main tie that comes across <coughs> under 116. I did talk to Rich Brenda about that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, conversations I had with Rich, um, I, we, from our discussion, we were very concerned about 
um, what kind of pitch it was on the line, um, if it was, you know, if we're going to have to do something with it. So I did talk to Rich, and, and basically he believes that, A, the, <clears throat> the line is very deep over here on School Street. Mm-hmm. Okay. It goes down 10 feet. Okay. So he, he believes that you have plenty of pitch, pitch coming yeah. from uh, like connection. Bridge Street mm-hmm. under 116 over, so he doesn't think that you'd have to have, because I told him, I said, it's just become problematic. Right. Now, the, the, we ended up having a very uh, um, interesting discussion about grease traps and about mm-hmm. restaurants. Mm-hmm. And, and if Sherry, if, I, if you could, I'd like to uh, review what we have in our sewer bylaws concerning grease traps. Grease traps. Um, yeah, and, and, it's important. and in the sewer business that's known as fog, fat mm-hmm. oil and grease, mm-hmm are a major concern. So I'd like to review what we have in, in the policies concerning uh, restaurants. And, and because you know, the, you know the BOD mode that you put on, now, now you've got um, um, garbage disposals and, and all that kind of good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so can we, uh, can we put an upcoming thing, we'd like to talk to uh, maybe bring Rich in and talk about the uh, fog. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and restaurants and places that may impact our uh, uh, loading of the wastewater treatment plant. So it was actually a very, a very good, very good discussion. Um, so, like I said, so that was a good thing. Mm-hmm. Another another point, the uh, we had a um, meeting with the uh, board of oversight of the um, senior center, Frank uh, South County Senior Center. Um, and it looks, we hired, um, a consultant about three months ago over at the South County Senior Center and, and it's a woman by the name of Diane who used to run the, uh, uh, Burns and Northfield and she's kind of going over the entire thing, looking at how the budget's formulated, et cetera. Um, and so she, she has found some, um, areas of concern so at our next special town meeting we may be addressing some of those mm-hmm. so those concerns but okay. it just so it's sustain is sustainable is that through the agreement or is it through the assessing process and we'll find um out. We'll find it, out the, the, the agreement the agreement really i mean the agreement hasn't changed but mm-hmm. but it's like the the maintenance of the building Got the it. cost for maintenance okay. of the building um how how the how the cost of the director and of the outreach you know, should it be funded through grants or should it be funded through, through the, and and, and how how it's uh, funded? So we we're, okay. were, we're talking about that. So so that's that's occurring right now. So to our next special town meeting, um, we'll 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 probably have it on that agenda, mm-hmm. um, so that we can look at how how we're paying for that. Um, we have a, uh, um, and. and we have a critical need, I would say, in in the town, and I'll put out the uh, the thing now. Is that we? It'd be really good if we have um, a more active uh, council of aging. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, we don't, um, and I think it's a it's a you don't. I, I would say that you do not have to be a senior to be a member of the council of aging. So if if you have if you're looking. And it's it's not a huge commitment, but if you have a concern for for um, the seniors, if you're a senior yourself in the program, um, if you could put in a, uh, a call to a call or email to the selectman's office, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you, or Sherry can talk to you about what the requirements are for a uh, person to be on the council of aging. But we'll it's, get something up on the website and see if we mm, can good. get me. We'll do newsletter hopefully. So. Yeah, it, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to have some as someone to to, to uh, um, you know a few people to have that that car could participate with that. Um, and I think that's it for me, Sherry. For uh, uh, administrator update. Um, the only update I have is on the street lights. Uh, the MAPC has awarded <clears throat> the bid for the install to Pine Ridge. You mm-hmm. might have. Seen some of the Email. correspondence yeah, yeah. <laughs> floating around. So we're getting ready for the install. It's scheduled for November 26th, um, and 
everything should be installed by um, December 21st, so just in time for Christmas. Um, we're at the point now where we're looking at the fixtures, and um, I think you have the summary of the um, vendors. Mm -hmm. um, Scott has asked for cut sheets and some more information, so I'll get that. Um, what I did find from uh, the consultant real term is that any um, of the lights that are going to be installed will be based on the need for the pedestrians and, and the traffic in the area. They really come out and take a good look at all of those things. Yeah. Um, the lights are 3,000 Kelvin mm -hmm. or 3,000 K. Uh, there's a 10-year warranty on the light. Uh, on the lights, all lights are DLC uh, rated for a design light um, consortium and performance longevity. Uh, the lights that were pre-2017, um, which you may have heard complaints about from other towns, were 4,000 K. Right, too and blue. Yes, and they were, a little cold. Yeah. And, yep. um, these are environmentally friendly lights. Um, yeah. Because that's more like the color temp you put in your kitchen. Yep, and the lights are future-proof, and uh, we can add future um, oh. dimmers via wireless <laughs> controls if yeah. we um, so choose to do that in the future. <laughs> um, the bids came oh, in won't. under. Our purchase price came in under. Yeah. So we have a little wiggle room if that's something that the board wants to consider later. Mm -hmm. I know there was some talk about maybe putting more lights on. Um, Are they Wi-Fi connected? Is that so? So could, could I ask that you talk to the uh, okay? That, that we talk to the the fire chief and the police chief. Yeah, and I've ask done that. Them, I've sent it. Oh, and ask okay. them if if, if they they have a recommendation if we we had um, places to install additional lights if they if they think where lighting is. Okay. Now, are we also doing the lighting on one sixteen? No, just the town owned. Town, There's town. 63 lights that will be. So we don't own the ones on, yeah, on 116? Yeah. That's Mass Highway. Yeah, that would be thing. There is theirs. Uh, it is interesting because I thought, I, I actually thought one time we did pay the bill, but that's good if we don't. We, we asked after an unfortunate incident yeah. to have a light put in specifically. Yes, in that area. We, <clears throat> the town did that, and it was only in that one. So is that still our light? That's still our mm -hmm. light. Yeah. Is that going to be part of the? Is that part I of the group? I would make sure that it's part of the count. Yeah. Okay. And but I would I would and 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 then, um, I mean over over the last five six seven years All we've that. had request yeah. we've had requests for lights. Um, yeah, additional um, ones. And maybe, maybe if we do have we can figure out what we have available and, mm -hmm. and if we could add you know. Right. Can we add one light, ten lights, or right. what? Actually, have, what room is there for any any additional fixtures? Right. Right. Maybe come up with a little process so that when we start getting asked, you know, then yeah. you've got a little review process that for it. Inside inside the program, we have to bear in mind now that owning and maintaining the fixtures, we're going to have to think about that. Yeah. Those steps. Do we use a contractor? Right. Do we have people who are of town employee involved? Outside of a warranty period. Yeah, right. we can. Right. Um, I have information <clears throat> so we can issue an RFP. Mm -hmm. um, Amherst um, also offers uh, through an intermunicipal yep. agreement. Yep. Hmm. There okay. may be some other towns out there. I doing can that way. Yep. Doing that um, that way. Greenfield. Uh, Greenfield. I'm not sure if they come down here. Hmm. I talked to Gil, who owns their own streetlights, and they go through Amherst, yep. and he said it's Do really that. very rare. Yep. He's maybe once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it should be a lot less them. common. Right. Yeah, that's good. Okay, but again, that's next steps for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about once the transition happens, you get through a warranty period. You have actually have right. real ownership. It's like now we've got to fix the happens. light. Some driver pukes on you, or um, sadly a pole gets hit. Or yeah. Whatever. Right. Yep. Okay. And then if one's out too, you know, right. do we put like a numbers on them or something, or like there's yeah. an inventory that comes with the database. Okay, that's good. Hey, what else you got here? <coughs> okay. Um, next on goes correspondence. You had an email from uh, Andrew Sackett. Yes, an email and a fo uh, phone call when he saw the posting about the permit mm -hmm. requirement. Mm -hmm. um, he reached out um, and he would like a permit. Mm -hmm. um, 
he's willing to register his trailer, car, whatever needs um, to be done. He likes to catfish mm -hmm. um, down there mm -hmm. at night, and I he think that. participates yeah. in a lot of fishing derbies mm -hmm. and those things. Um, and he's been fishing there for years, so um, said he said he's happy to register or pay for a permit or uh, whatever he needs to do. And I told him, this is really new for us. Mm -hmm. It's only been up a couple of weeks, so. Yeah. Um, um, do we talk? Do we talk to the? Uh, I mean, is it simple as is? Uh, they just contact the police department. To you know, it's kind of what I wrote down. To, if yeah. I could, Mr. Chair, you know, yeah, permit for the can't. night. Notify the police the day of the, yeah, the day of it. There. You're going to be there that day. This is my plate number. You have it on. I, I mean, when I go fishing and on it's the, just what, surveillance at that point. When I go fishing on the Cape mm -hmm. on the National Seashore, I just go stop in. East hand and yep. and pick up our permit and mm -hmm. just throw it on my mm -hmm. just throw it on the windshield and if you're and then you have something for fishing that mm -hmm. you're gonna be fishing after eleven mm -hmm. overnight That's and you just put it on yeah. your windshield you know put it inside so I I, I you know we could could we ask the chief I I don't think it's anything more than just calling the the chief and uh, or the 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 police and say we're gonna be there it, it, it begs the question if I could Mr Chair the Maybe there is an annual that again. I don't see any fees associated with this. Yeah. Just it's a notification right. thing. It's like stop by, get your your pass, whatever it is. It stays in your windshield. Yeah. At each time you come back here, as opposed to making it a step for every single visit. Yeah. Right. That's fine. Make it an annual. Make it 2018. There's right. your big red P or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, but we can talk to the just for about. after hours. Yeah, just yeah. for after hours. Right, because especially yeah. in light of some of the complaints that we've had about right. people down there, this right. way, they know, oh, okay, that's so-and-so in the so -and -so environmental and police are watching it. Did you see that? Yes, yes. Of apparently they are. are. So, no? okay. That's good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, the uh, new business is the fur Prog Agreement for Services for the ADA plan. Mm -hmm. Sherry, that's what the... Uh, the $20,000 grant. Yeah, it's for the development of the town self-evaluation and transition plan. They'll look at um, all of our programs, services, buildings, sidewalks, and those things, and come mm -hmm. up with a plan um, of how to implement handicapped accessibility mm -hmm. uh, for those. Okay. This is both facilities and practices, Sherry? Yes, programs, okay. practices, yeah. all of those things. Okay. Policy. So, um, motion to sign? Uh, so moved. Second. Well, we have a motion made to sign the agreement for services uh, with the FERCOG for the ADA plan for the town of Sunderland. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, we have 3 0. Um, approval of note renewal, 120 North Main. Uh, that's for the uh, renewal for the loan for the 120 North Main Street house. It's downstairs. It's, it's downstairs. 145,000. I'll go get it. So yeah. Need it. <laughs> I think it's it is 145,000. Any keys? I might need keys. Yeah. Actually, I've got it right in my bag. Oh, God. <clears throat> I don't know if that other door got shut. It's actually in my rectangle. Uh, <laughs> I just have a rectangle. We also have the state election warrant, too, to be yeah. signed as well. So. Yep, that time. I also saw Sherry in our mail that uh, the um, Union 38 has announced that uh, the bargaining for t the contract mm -hmm. negotiation. Now, I feel like we just did that. I was going to say, it seems like we did just do that. Almost every three years. Oh. Yeah, so I put that on the agenda for October 9th. Okay. That's okay. Okay, can I now he's not looking for is was a superintendent looking for a represented representative from each town selectman rep from each town? So it's not how you that's yeah. usually how yeah. no for the oh no, usually it's just one. Oh, for all of the towns, yeah. Oh, okay, the let four, me get the, so me, could you could you talk to because yep. just typically it was just one. 
for Frontier. It, oh, for okay. Union, for Frontier. Union yes. 38. There Union we have separate towns. Was, yeah. was a member from each town. Okay. Right? Yes. Yep. Well, the Frontier one was one selectman from the four towns. The Union 38 is one from each. Mm -hmm. So, because there's two separate, there's two separate contracts. Yeah. Okay. Clarification. Sort of going back to the note, if I could, Mr. Chair. This is a for a hundred and forty-seven thousand dollar one-year ball, one-year note to uh, East Hampton Savings Bank. Was a little bitter this time. Two point five five percent. It was at up a little below, bit. At or below one at one yeah. point. Yeah, we don't have our big book anymore to look at. No, I know. It's kind of annoying, isn't it? The big, the big book had a lot of history. It's as much fun as the big bond book. Oh, bond book. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's a, a recommendation of the treasurer collector. 147 even to East Hampton Savings Bank. Uh, October 11, 2019, it's done. Okay. All those in favor of the, uh, the note removal, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, Sherry, three zero, and we'll uh, sign that. The next is a uh, the vote for state election warrant. The warrant. Scott, do you have that? The actual, read that. The actual warrant itself. Let's see if I can grab that here. Do, do, do. <clears throat> that big one. Uh, in the name of the Commonwealth, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of said city or town who are qualified to vote in the state election to vote at 1 Swampfield Drive, affectionately referred to as the Sunderland Elementary School, on Tuesday, the 6th day of November 2018, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Remember that 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. for the following purpose casting the votes uh, in the state election for candidates in the following offices. Senator and Congress for the Commonwealth, Governor and Lieutenant Governor for the Commonwealth, Attorney General for the Commonwealth, Secretary of State for the Commonwealth, Treasurer and Receiver General for the Commonwealth, Auditor for the Commonwealth, Representative for the Second District, Counselor for the Eighth District, Senator and General Court for Hampshire Franklin Worcester District, Representative and General Court for First Franklin District, District Attorney for the Northwestern District, Clerk of Courts for Franklin County, Register of Deeds for Franklin County, and the Franklin County uh, Council of Governments, Franklin County. And there are propositions on here as well. There is one, two, I'm sorry, three referenda questions, okay? And again, that is uh, read as a warning to the inhabitants November 18th at the Sunland Elementary School, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. All those in uh, favor of uh, the state election work, please say the five bytes. All motion? We have motion. I'll second. <clears throat> Made second to office to participate in the state election. Isn't that something? It's good to do. It is. All those in favor, please say the five bytes saying aye. 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 If, if I could, um, after the last, last election that happened on a school day um good point and there was cars and no parking and and it was i i asked the town clerk what if there was a possibility of moving mm -hmm. the elections and she said by golly there is um and and if if we remember back to when the library mm -hmm. was first built mm -hmm. that was one of the things that was offered up as a Reason oh, and, and that we could vote in the library. The what the town clerk has to do though is to make it happen. She she needs to um, come up with a way to put voting booths in there. Mm -hmm. So um, we did ask someone um, if they would uh, like to work on that project, and we're waiting back from a response. Um, so the the the. Town clerk has some requirements for it. It won't happen for this election, right. um, but I think that's something that we got to look into. Sure. And, and, and actually, there, there's a couple. Of a, there was just no room at, at school. Right? Yeah. There, I mean, for parking. Plus, um, I don't know if the, it's the best thing to have elections that you know going on in the school 
mm-hmm. with all the I mean there's so many people going in and right. out of there so so we're looking at that if only we had them on the weekend or we had it as a civics school day off. Well, as it was used to exactly. be when I was in school. I, I, it they was do, like that do. when I was in I school too, it. right? They do. I yeah. get it. Because yeah. I'm a little concerned over here, there's not a, a ton of parking necessarily here either. There certainly wouldn't be that, you know. I, I, mean, I, I get the issue. You've got the there, you're all, you get the, the yeah, whole street. along there. And you go all the way down. Correct. You can go back. Back of the town office building, got the grass. Well, you could wrap around, yeah. Yeah, there, there, yeah. There, I think there's. Um, you have an innovative way for the town clerk to make an, uh, a mobile election unit. So there you go. Right? Pull the trailer up, check in the front, walk through, <laughs> process, go out the back. They do have those. Yeah. That's do interesting. Have so, anyway. So yeah, that's what we're we're gonna. Kind of neat, I like it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it it was and and actually it happens after they it, they came into more prevalence after the uh, the hurricanes and down in uh, New yeah. Orleans and stuff. They 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 started developing that mm-hmm. stuff to keep the elections going. Boy, I could say something right now, but then I'd get on the national scene. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. I'm, I'm resisting. Yeah. I'd say just there get out go. there and, and participate in resist. the process. Sherry, I'm resisting. <laughs> well, I, Chris, you got that okay. beep. You got that button to beat me, right? If I, I the red Thank button. Thank you, sir. Right there. Thank you. Although you just gave the the what you just gave the wrong sign back okay. there. Now, now, oh my gosh, These I have no one got a picture of that. We would be in trouble. <laughs> anyway, um. It, I, I will digress for one second. Sure. When I when I this summer I, I did have the opportunity to go to the to, I was spent some time up in the Yukon and, and there's only forty thousand people and in, in, in a huge place and and I and I walk in one morning early and I asked I says is this Dawson City person I says is there a place to buy a newspaper he says nah we're not a lot into newspapers I said why what do you mean he says well we live out here there's there's not a lot of us. And you know, the government really doesn't care what we think anyway, so we just don't bother with the newspapers. It is just a waste of time. Plus the news is old by the time we get it. By the time we get it, that's funny. Sorry, Chris, I know you're a newspaper guy. Anyways, so we- Just get it online. We, yeah, we get it online. So um, Sunland, our, our next part, and you've probably seen signage going up around town, and, and Sunland has as a continuation of our celebration of our 300, the, uh, the the Sunland Autumn Stroll, which is occurring October 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we'd like, you know, people to uh, come out and participate. There's, uh, you can take an Autumn Stroll along North, I mean, along Main Street um, on Saturday, October 6th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we have the, uh, the Main Street Antique uh, and Classic Car Show. Uh, there's going to be a repeat of the very successful 275th anniversary the Ghost of Sunderland performance, and that'll be happening Octo- uh, October 6th, Saturday, from 12:30 to 3. Um, both of these have rain dates of uh, October 13th. On October 6th, there's going to be a quilt display and church history display at the Congregational Church, and that is on Sunday. There will be a special congregational church service on Sunday, October 7th at 10 a.m. And there's also going to be an arts exhibit and historical society open. <coughs> and that's going to be from Friday through Monday, October 5th through 8th, from 10 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. And I think, last I heard, is there's 30 artists that's going to 30 artists that are going to be involved with that, displaying displaying their art. Um, so I think that's going to kind of be a very uh, an interesting thing, along with the uh, the other uh, things that are ongoing during that time. So if you're looking for something to do on uh, on on uh, October Columbus Day weekend, October fifth, sixth, seventh, to take a stroll along Main Street in Sunderland, and you will have a, a boatload of things to do. Um, and we're really looking forward to that the. The 300th committee is also putting together a uh, Veterans Day services. Oh, nice. Will be will be happening around Veterans Day in November. Also, there's a going to be a, a gala ball that's going to be held at the Blue Heron. Uh, there are still tickets available, so if you'd like, you can contact uh, Tracy Zachary or Justine Rosewern 
or the town office and we can get you the, the numbers or the people. Um, and I, that should be a very interesting thing, and that's going to be it's November. It's November, in, in November, right? but kind of like the weekend after Veterans Day. So, so um, it'll be a Saturday evening. It'll be a nice time to go out and have a good time. Okay, anything else? I know that's all, Mr. Chair. Nope. David? I'm good. Sherry? All set. Motion? Uh, motion. I'll second a motion to adjourn. We have a motion made, seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We have a unanimous, can you believe that, a unanimous uh, adjournment at uh, 8.43. Wait, fake Or 7.43. Uh, must be a 7 fake adjournment. 7.43. Thank you, FGAT. <laughs>